Hi, I'm Jerome Pitazzoni, your instructor for Linode's Kubernetes workshop about setting up GitLab on Kubernetes with Helm. In this four and a half hour workshop, you will learn how to set up the traffic ingress controller, secure HTTP access with TLS thanks to the search manager operator, check resource usage with Kubernetes metrics server, Prometheus and Grafana, and much more. We'll deploy everything with Helm, so of course you will learn a lot about that as well. Hi, welcome to this workshop. In this series of videos, we will see how to do cloud-native continuous deployment with GitLab, Helm, and Linode Kubernetes engine. So I'm Jerome Petazzoni. You can find me on Twitter and on pretty much every other social media under jpetazzo. Uh, I worked at Docker for about seven years, which is a very long time. Uh, I was there before Docker was Docker and I quit in early 2018. And since then, I've been doing consulting and training around Docker, containers in general, and Kubernetes. I have a bunch of other materials like slides, videos, documentation, tutorials, etc. on container.training, so feel free to check that out if you want uh, more content. So in this series of videos, we will see how to deploy a complete CI-CD pipeline using LKE, so Linode Kubernetes Engine. Um, so we're going to use Helm to deploy almost everything, and I'm going to try to show you as much as possible uh, how the sausage is made, is made so to speak. Um, so I'm going to use like a bunch of slides that you can see here and you can access these slides online which can be convenient if you want to copy paste some commands etc if you want to follow along you know. Um, so if you access the slides using that address right there you'll be able to move around the slides like this with arrows. Uh, you can also type a slide number like you can see in the corner uh, that says we are at slide number three but let's say that I'm at uh, slide number 123 you can type 123 enter and that will take you to that slide um, there might be some you know slight offsets between the slides I'm showing you and the slides that you get online uh, because I might do some little tweaks some improvements maybe there are going to be some bugs or typos maybe I'm going to add some content later so if you see that they are off by a few slides don't worry, that's, that's normal, that's okay. If you want, you can also download these slides. Like, why would you want to do that? I don't know, but just in case, um, if you follow that link, that's going to give you a zip file with all these slides. Uh, the slides are open source, like the, 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 this whole deck and many other decks that I use for training, workshops, etc. This is all in a public GitHub repo and you're welcome to get that repo, fork that repo, get these slides, you know, build your own deck, do whatever you want with that. If you are a professional trainer yourself and you want to reuse these materials, you can. This is open source. This is, in a way, one of my contributions to the cloud native ecosystem. One thing is that if you, uh, if you get your mouse to the lower edge of the slides like this, you will see this little black bar here. And if we click here, that's going to tell us to take us to the source of the slide here in Markdown. And so here, you know, you can change things, send pull requests, etc, etc. You will also see a bunch of slides with that little uh, magnifying glass icon in the corner. This means extra details. It means this is some extra information that you know may or may not be super relevant right now. Uh, the idea is that the first time you're checking out the content, you can probably just ignore these slides. But then if at some point you're like, okay, I really want to know more, hopefully these slides will have the details that, that you want. Um, table of contents, this is what I want to cover in this series of videos. Um, first, we're going to see like what we need to follow along. Then I will show you the application that we want to deploy with our CD pipeline. Then we're going to deploy an LKE cluster. So we're going to get our own Kubernetes cluster. Um, then we will deploy a little app there that's going to be a little review of Kubernetes concepts. Um, then we're going to see how to access internal services. And then we're going to talk about 
what's missing uh, in that cluster to make it more you know, I wouldn't say production grade, but we're going to talk about DNS setup, uh, ingress metrics. Uh, then we're going to talk about Helm. We'll see how to manage things with Helm, how to install things with Helm on our Kubernetes cluster. And then we're going to use Helm to install that uh, DNS integration, uh, to install traffic as an ingress controller, to install the metrics server, to install Prometheus and Grafana, Search Manager, and finally, uh, CICD with GitLab. All right, get ready. And before we dive in, I would like to talk about what we need to know, what we need to have uh, to be comfortable with that whole workshop. So I try to follow what we sometimes call the Unix philosophy. I don't know if it's exactly the Unix philosophy, like who came up with that, but you know, this idea that we take many pretty simple tools like find, sort, grab, etc., and we combine them in these big pipelines, you know, find this file, pipe grab this, pipe grab dash v that, pipe sort, pipe xargs, etc., uh, and we get a pretty interesting combination. And so I try to do that uh, when setting up uh, GitLab on Kubernetes. So try to get like separate components, install the components separately so that we have a, a, a nice thing once we put everything together. Except for GitLab, unfortunately, that doesn't work so well because uh, a CD pipeline is by definition like many tightly interconnected components. We need a Git server, you know, like something that you can Git push to. We need to have some runner or whatever to build container images and we need to push them to a registry. So ah, we need a registry. Um, then we need a nice web interface on top of that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like to operate all that, we probably need a bunch of databases and storage systems, etc., etc. So if we take a look at the dependencies of GitLab, uh, this is what we find. And as you can see, we have a gazillion of dependencies. Uh, some of them, which I call like internal, uh, that's basically software like completely written by and for GitLab. So it's kind of exclusive to, to GitLab. And then we have external dependencies, which are things that are used by GitLab, but that are not written by GitLab for like, for instance, a Postgres database, uh, Redis, the Docker registry, etc, etc. So how am I going to apply the Unix philosophy here? Because I don't want us to install every single one of these things one by one. Uh, but I also want to be able to reuse components when that makes sense. So my litmus test here is if it's a component that is used only by GitLab, we're going to install it together with GitLab. Now, if it's a component that we could reuse separately, I want to install that separately. So for instance, um, the ingress controller to manage the HTTP connections on our cluster, that's going to be installed separately. Cert manager to obtain TLS search, installed separately. The DNS integration, install separately. Prometheus and Grafana, guess what? We're also going to have them separately. However, everything that is directly linked to GitLab, that's going to be installed with the GitLab charts. That's, that's going to be like one big um, set of, uh, as I was saying, like deeply interconnected components. All right. So that's our roadmap. Uh, we will need a Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to use Linode Kubernetes Engine, LKE. Uh, I'm going to run a simple uh, app on that, you know, just to get ourselves situated and remember how Kubernetes works, like the, the basics. Uh, then we're going to add a few extras on that cluster. We're going to kind of customize it a little bit. And then we will be able to install GitLab and set up our CD pipeline. Okay, so what do you need to know? Uh, if you just want to follow along, you know, and watch and sit back and relax, 
Uh, you just need to know a little bit about containers, like uh, know what a container is, what an image is. If you have done a few Docker run, Docker build, then I think you will be able to follow along and understand what's going on. Uh, maybe a few sometimes, maybe you will need to pause and review, etc. But that's the whole point of having a recorded video. Uh, but I will try to give as much explanations and extra details as possible uh, so that everything makes sense. If you want to not only follow along, but also run all these demos and labs and set up your own GitLab, well, uh, you will need some familiarity with Kubernetes, you know, know the, the basic concepts of Kubernetes. Hopefully you have already worked a little bit with Kubernetes. If you have never touched uh, a cluster before, well, I don't want to discourage you, but things might be a little bit rough and bumpy, but I mean, by all means, feel free to, to try anyway. Um, in particular, each time that we will hit the point where something could go wrong, I'm going to try and anticipate as much as possible because guess what? When I put this thing together, I, I spent like days and days, you know, running everything multiple times in different scenarios. And so I have a few ideas of the things that could go wrong. Not all of them, of course, but I'm going to try to tell you ahead of time, hey, you know what? Here, we might run into that and that kind of problem. So let, and I will give you some commands to troubleshoot view logs, etc. But of course, it will be easier if you already have some experience with Kubernetes. So if you want to, you know, deploy GitLab on your own cluster, uh, this is what you will need. Uh, you will need a Linode account uh, so that you can create your Kubernetes cluster. You will need a domain name. Um, so you might wonder, hey, why do I need a domain, a domain name? Long story short, TLS, um, I will explain later with more details. Uh, but just so you know, for this workshop, uh, I bought like cloudnative.party. Uh, that was like five bucks. And now I have this domain for a year. So I think uh, until the end of 2021, all my demos now are going to be on cloudnative.party. Uh, and that was just five bucks. So that's less than a fancy hipster coffee. So that's fine. Um, now you will need some tools to control our Kubernetes cluster. So we will need kubectl. Kubectl, you know, that's the basic CLI tool to do everything with Kubernetes. And we will need Helm because I'm going to try and install everything that I can with Helm. I'm going to explain why when we get there, but we will need Helm and you will need some patience because some of these demos are going to take time. Sometimes, you know, we're like, okay, now we wait for the DNS thing to propagate or now we wait for all these pods to come up and that might take a few minutes, sometimes five, 10, 15 minutes. So th this is not the kind of demo that you could just run, you know, in 15 minutes, uh, everything included to impress your coworkers. No, some, in some steps, I'll tell you, okay, and now come back in five minutes. Um, so the advantage of video is that you won't need to wait five minutes while pods start, etc., etc. But just be warned, um, there will be some, uh, uh, some, some waiting time involved at, at some point. Um, now, if you're wondering, okay, do I really need to have a Linode account? Can't I run that on my own Kubernetes cluster, on Capsule, GKE, or my local Minikube, or whatever? Sort of. Um, if you have another um, Kubernetes cluster uh, with another provider, things should mostly work. You might have to adapt a few things, but it should mostly work because Kubernetes is a pretty standard platform and the LKE, like the Linode Kubernetes engine, is a compliant platform. So there is nothing fancy or exotic about it. It follows the standards. And so as long as your cluster also follows the standards, you'll be fine. Now, if you're working with a local cluster, things are going to be a little bit harder again because of TLS. We will need to have some valid TLS certificates and I'm going to use Let's Encrypt for that. And if you are running a local Kubernetes cluster, that might not work so well. So just be warned. Um, if you're wondering about that domain name thing, so the reason why we need domain name, first, it's just nicer to have a domain name rather than typing IP addresses and also for these TLS certificates. 
why do we absolutely need TLS certificates? Uh, because Docker registries. When you pull images from a Docker registry, uh, the Docker registry has to use TLS and the certificates have to be valid. There are some hacks to work around that, but they are really ugly and I don't want to go there. Uh, so if you decide, no, I don't want to use a, a domain name, I don't want to use TLS and certificates, feel free to try and hack your way around. But honestly, I don't think it's worth the effort. Again, uh, a domain name is less than five bucks these days. So um, get one and, you, and, and, and we're also going to do some really cool integration uh, with external DNS so that when we deploy Kubernetes services and ingress resources, uh, this will populate a DNS zone. And I think that's pretty cool too. All right. Now, in addition to uh, kubectl and helm, I also suggest uh, that you have the following things. Uh, the Linode CLI, just in case, you know, like it's, I'm, I'm a huge CLI fan and I like to script things. So of course I have the Linode CLI. Uh, Stern, Stern is a way to stream uh, logs from pods on Kubernetes. And I also recommend to have that, it's super convenient. Uh, if you like the kind of retro look and feel of Norton Commander, Midnight Commander, like things like that, uh, maybe you want to install K9S. I guess we should say K9s. Uh, K9S is, well, let me show you that that looks like this. So this is K9S uh, that gives you um, a view on your Kubernetes cluster and you can navigate in there. Uh, and you know, it's a, uh, I guess now we call that a TUI, a text user interface. Um, and some folks love it, some folks hate it. Um, but I feel like I had to show you that because if you didn't know it, maybe that's going to make your day. Uh, so yeah, I suggest that you have that because it, it could be useful at times. Couple of other things, uh, kubeps one and kubectx. kubeps one uh, this is the custom prompt that uh, I have here. And this reminds me at all times uh, on which cluster I'm working right now. So right now it's telling me, okay, I'm working on my local kind cluster. Uh, so that's a really nice reminder. And when we will uh, deploy clusters on Linode, uh, then this prompt will change and it will always kind of remind me, okay, now you're working on a remote cluster. Super useful. I highly recommend it if you're working with Kubernetes. And then kubectx. kubectx uh, is going to be uh, a, a little shell tool to quickly switch between contexts, but also between namespaces. Uh, so again, like this is not strictly necessary, but I guarantee that this will, will make your lives or at least the Kubernetes sides of your lives easier. So get them. Warning, um, we're going to spin up cloud resources and it's not going to cost much as long as we remember to shut things down when we're done. Um, in the to quote my friend Corey Quinn, uh, the, the business model of cloud <laughs> is that you get charged for what you forget to turn off. You know, like cloud vendors will tell you, oh, you get charged for what you use. Okay, but that's normal. No, but the kind of like the, the, the small print is that you get charged for what you forget to turn off. And I don't want you to be charged for things that you forget to turn off. So, you know, maybe um, at the moment when you will start these clusters, it will be a good time to set a post-it note on the edge of your screen. Like remember to shut down these clusters when you're done uh, so that you don't end up having a, a cloud bill for things that you, that you don't use. <laughs>